us online. Join us as we sing these old hymns of the church. Amen. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. He made my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole. Have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about our troubles, hear our faintest cry, answer by and by. Talk with Jesus makes it right. Oh, I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. Oh, I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Have a little talk with Jesus, tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry, answer by and by. A little prayer will turn it, know a little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus, makes through the courts again. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry, answer by and by. A little prayer will turn it, know a little fire is burning. A little talk with Jesus makes it right. That's how you end, Kelly, that's how you end a Southern Gospel song. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight as we continue to worship Him. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We are so grateful and we're so thankful, Lord, that we can meet together uh, in your name and fellowship with other believers in you, Lord, our brothers and sisters in Christ, we can sing praises unto your name, and we can open up and study your word. Lord, may America always be able to enjoy that. Thank you, Father, for the freedom that we have. Let us never take it for granted. Father, I pray tonight, Lord, that as we sing unto you, that your Holy Spirit, he will come and he will fill this place and he will meet with us, Father. You are welcomed here. You don't need our permission, but, Lord, you are welcome here to move and work as you see fit. Thank you, Lord, for Brother Jim. Thank you for the way he delivers your word. And, Father, I pray tonight that we will have hearts to receive it and ears to hear it, Lord, and help us to apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let's continue to sing. Not you, Kathy. You're Kathy. Baby's in the back. <laughs> As, here we go. As I wander through this pilgrim, there is a friend who walks with me. Oh, leads me safely through the sinking sea. It is the Christ of Calvary. This will be my prayer to Lord each day to help me do the best I can. Hold my hand. Jesus, 
just hold my hand.
prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Amen. Thank you, Brian, choir, praise team. Thank you, Jesus, Harvey Mann. Well, what a wonderful day. It's been a Jesus day, and thank you, Jesus, for Sunday night church. If you have your Bibles tonight, please turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Those that are home, we hope that you join with us. Make sure you get your down, load your outline. Luke chapter 19 tonight. One week to live. Um. Wednesday night, we continue our study on spiritual warfare, and uh, Jesus tells us we're going to do uh, nine words that defeated Satan. Nine words that defeated Satan. You know the nine words. It is written, it is finished, he is risen. Those are the nine words that defeated Satan. So uh, we'll look at that uh, uh, message Wednesday night on spiritual warfare, and and uh, hope you can join join us then as well. Um, I got a call this afternoon from Kelly Waddell. She was on her way to their church there in in Garland, and said I saw a uh, um, ambulance and paramedics at Jan Gruber's house. She said I was I was just wanted to call and let you know, Brother Jim. So I called Jan. It wasn't Jan. It was her grandson. Uh, Wes, who's had heart issues, and uh, he's fine. They didn't take him. He's just, uh, uh, he, Jan Botterford. Who did I say? Jan Gruber? Well, well, here's a miracle right here, folks. Right here. Right. Amen. So uh, she's, she's, yes, sir, we can sing. Okay, okay, Jan, I understand that, okay? Uh, anyway, Jan Botterford, excuse me. Uh, but anyway, thank God, I talked to her this afternoon. She's doing good, and Wes is still home. Uh, her daughter had her knee replaced. Jill had a knee replacement surgery last week, and she's doing fine. That's who I thought it might have been. But uh, I called Jan, and she's doing fine. So thank you, Jesus. And so is Miss Gruber. So, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord. Luke chapter 19. If you got it, say you got it. Let's stand in honor of God's Word together. Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 37. And when Jesus was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these would hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's all pray this prayer together tonight. Those that are home with, watching the services, those here at Cornerstone, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, please speak to my heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What would you do if you had one week to live? You know, I tell you, coming to service like this, this small of a crowd, I feel like I'm back in the Marine Corps about scattering out so one round won't get us. So if something goes off, we don't have to worry. You guys are scattered out like we're dove hunting or something, guys. It was too bad y'all couldn't get a little closer, but uh, that's fine. But uh, anyway... What would you do if you had one week to live? You know, we preached a message one time on King Hezekiah. 
Remember Isaiah the prophet went to him and said, set your house in order because you're fixing to die, boy. Do you all remember that in Isaiah? You know, uh, what would happen if the prophet would come to your house and said, you better set your house in order for you're about to die. And we talked about King Hezekiah and what he did. Immediately he went to prayer. That's always a good thing to do, amen. We, we know what the story, how the story ended with Hezekiah. He prayed God gave him 15 more years. He should have went ahead and died because in that 15 years he had a son by the name of Manasseh born who was the worst king of all of Israel. Sometimes God will give you your permissive will. There's his perfect will, personal will, and permissive will. All three of them are taught in the Bible. But let me tell you, Hezekiah should have went ahead and been, went home to be with Jesus because those 15 years he lived, he birthed a son who was the worst king, the most idolatrous king Israel ever had. We don't have to guess what Jesus did the last week of his life. It's found in all four Gospels. And the Bible tells us what Jesus did the last week of his life. I want us to look at that together, and then we'll get to the meat of the message. Number one, on Sunday, where we just read in Luke 19, that is on Sunday, and we have a parade. Write it down. It's the triumphant entry of of Jesus. There was a parade. It was forecasted in the Old Testament, prophesied by the prophets. And it's interesting when Jesus made, the Bible said, made his descent, into Jerusalem. Those of us, those of you who've been with us to Israel, you know how that works. Because he's coming from Bethany. He's been with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. That's about five miles from where he made his descent and his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, the interesting thing about when Jesus made his way into Jerusalem, he tells the disciples while he's still in Bethany, he's five miles away from Jerusalem. Are y'all with me? And he tells his disciples, a couple of his disciples, he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem and go to this certain street and you're going to find a donkey that's never been ridden tied up. You unloose that donkey and if someone says, what are you doing with that donkey? Just tell them, the Lord hath need of them. Now look up here. Jesus' triumphant entry started with a demonstration of his deity. You see, Jesus is omniscient. He could see five miles away. He's not Superman, goofball. But look here, he could see five miles away, tell you there, at this certain street, there's going to be a donkey tied. That's omniscient. That's his deity. It was, on explay, it was on display right there to his disciples. There was a demonstration of his deity, but there's also a demonstration of his authority. For he said, if someone asks you, what are you going to do with that donkey? Tell them, the Lord hath need of him. Amen. Guys, that's authority. When the Lord tells you to do something, you better do it because he is the final authority. Say amen to that. So as Jesus, look up here, guys. He makes, he's making his descent into Jerusalem. There was a demonstration of his deity and his authority. As he makes his way in, he's riding a lowly donkey, and then there was a manifestation. It starts off with a demonstration. Then it begins, then it, secondly, it becomes a manifestation of two things. As Jesus makes his descent into Jerusalem on the top of that donkey, there was a manifestation of two L's. There was a manifestation of his lowliness, his lowliness because he's riding a donkey. And it's called a lowly donkey. It's in fulfillment of Bible prophecy in the book of Zechariah that when Jesus made his triumphal entry, he'd ride a donkey. That speaks of his lowliness. By the way, Philippians 2, Paul said he humbled himself and became a servant. He's not riding a white stallion this time, guys. Are you out there, please? Luke 19, he's riding a donkey. When he comes again, he'll be on that white stallion. But when he came the first time, he came as a lowly servant. So we have a demonstration. Notice, then we got a manifestation, not only of his lowliness, riding a donkey, but then we got a manifestation of his loftiness for the people are singing glory to God in the highest. That's the song for the Messiah. It was one of the messianic psalms in the book of Psalms. It was a prophecy when Jesus would come, they'd be singing glory to God in the highest. It's a manifestation of his loftiness. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. 
They weren't, they weren't singing lowly shepherd. They were singing glory to God in the highest. Now notice this. We got a parade. Starts off Sunday. He makes his descent. There's a demonstration of his deity and his authority. He makes his way into Jerusalem. There was a manifestation of his lowliness and his loftiness. Finally, when he gets to Jerusalem, there is an examination. Write it down. You got three words there you need to write down. It's not in your outline. And I know if you don't got blanks for you, you're not going to fill it out because you're lazy. But let me just tell you, there's a demonstration, a manifestation. Then there is a examination. Say those three words with me. There was a. Y'all remember what Jesus said when he came? He began to weep over the city and said, How many times, Jerusalem? How many times would I gather you as a hen would gather her chicks? Are y'all out there, please? He examined the city and he wept over the city of Jerusalem. He said, How many times would I gather you together as a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not come to me? It was an examination on Sunday as Jesus wept over the city. Of Jerusalem, so Monday. What what happened the last week of his uh, last week of his life? It started on Sunday with a parade. Go to Monday. On Monday, notice there was a, a, a purifying, cleansing of the temple. Because you remember when he went to Jerusalem on Monday, he goes to the temple and he said, "My father's house should be called a house of prayer, but you made a, a den of thieves." He takes a whip. And it drives them out. Those money changes. Are you out there, please? God wants his temple to be clean. And by the way, that temple is a picture of my life and yours. Our temple needs to be clean as well. But let me tell you, on Sunday, there was a parade. Monday, there was a purifying, the cleansing of the temple. Number On Tuesday, write it down, there was a prophecy. A prophecy. This is found in all four Gospels. You have to put them all together to get the days together. But on Tuesdays, when Jesus' disciples came to him on the Mount of Olives and said, what will be the signs of your coming? And Jesus gives that great discourse. We read part of it this morning in Matthew chapter 24 on his second coming. That happened on Tuesday. When the disciples said, Lord, how we know we're living in the last days? That was on Tuesday. Uh, as he is a prophecy concerning his coming again. But notice also on Tuesday, there was a confrontation with the Pharisees. They were arguing about Jesus' authority. They argued about Jesus paying taxes. They argued about his resurrection because on Tuesday, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. They thought he was talking about Solomon's temple or Herod's temple. Are you out there, please? He was talking about this temple, his body. So on Tuesday, there was a prophecy. Then there was a confrontation. There's always confrontation with Jesus and religion. Are you out there, please? Christianity, there's a difference between heaven and hell, between Christianity and religion. The Pharisees were always confronting Jesus. And in, on Tuesday, when you studied the Gospels, that's when they argued and confronted him about his authority. Who do you think you are? Where do you get this authority from? They argued with him, confronted him about him paying taxes. That's when he sent Simon Peter to the Sea of Galilee and, and said, catch that fish and there's money to pay the temple tax. That all happened on Tuesday. And that's when Jesus said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. And they thought he was talking about Herod's temple when he was talking about his own life. Sunday, was, there was a what? Monday? Tuesday. Right down Wednesday. It's a period of silence. I shared with you this morning, when you studied the Gospels, this is the only day we have no record of what Jesus did. But I shared with you this morning, I believe he went to Wednesday night church. I'm just reading between the lines a little bit as a Baptist preacher. But, uh, you know, we, we're silent for a reason. When we get there, you can ask him. By the way, when you get there, you won't care. I have people all the time, well, I can't wait to see Jesus. Mark. I can't wait to talk to him about that. You ain't going to talk about squat. When you get there, you're just going to be glad you're there. All those stupid questions you're going to ask Jesus, you're ignorant. By the way, when we get there, there'll be no questions because we'll have all the answers because we'll be like Jesus. Are y'all out there, please? So 
Wednesday, period of silence. Thursday is the preparation for the Passover. By the way, this last week of Jesus' life was the Passover week. It was a Passover. Josephus said there were at least three million Jews, three million Jews worldwide that had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. It's the preparation for the Passover. Thursday's when he instituted the Lord's Supper in the upper room. That all happened on Thursday when he, he had the upper room meeting with, with his disciples and said, one of you is going to betray me tonight. When he instituted the Lord's Supper. Thursdays when they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. After he instituted the Lord's Supper, they went to Jesus' favorite place to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. That all happened on Thursday evening. Also, there was a final pre-Calvary miracle. You know what that final pre-Calvary miracle was? Some of you do. Now, George, okay, just oh, you're shaking your head. Yes, what was it, George? That's right, you're right, you're right, right. I love you, George. Jen, you didn't know it. Thank you, George. Because you didn't say nothing. Look up here. <laughs> hey, guys, look up here. George is exactly right. Y'all remember the, when, the, when the mob come to arrest Jesus, oh, Simon Peter, he takes his sword out, and he cuts the ear off of the high priest, one of the high priest's servants. And that's when Jesus restored that servant's ear. It was his final pre-Calvary miracle. Now, there was some miracles at Calvary. The greatest miracle, there was two salvations, a thief on the cross and a soldier on the ground. Woo! Are you out there, please? Those are the greatest miracles. Two people saved when he went to the cross. A dying thief. And a soldier, a sinner and a soldier. One on the cross, one on the ground. A sinner on the cross, soldier on the ground, and they had salvation. That's the greatest. But this is the pre-Calvary, last, final miracle that Jesus performed for he went to the cross, for he performed the greatest miracle of all, and that's salvation. Amen. Fill in the blanks. Uh, Thursday night begins the seven unfair trials of Jesus. There were seven unfair trials of Jesus that run into Friday morning. Then Friday morning at 9 o'clock, Jesus is crucified on the cross. That's the passion. The passion of Jesus' death on the cross for your sins and mine. They nailed him on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. He cried, it is finished. Into thy hands, Lord, I commend my spirit at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Are you out there, please? Six hours that changed the world. Say amen to that. Six hours that changed the world from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., six hours. That's all it took for Jesus to change the world. His passion on the cross. Now, it's interesting, Brother Lynn. When Jesus died on the cross, there were different reactions that day, Friday. There were different reactions when you study the Scriptures, Brother Michael. Uh, there was three different reactions to Jesus' death. Number one, would you write it down? There were some who grieved over Jesus' death. Please say amen to that. There were, there, there were those there that day who grieved over his death. Who were they? There was his disciples. There, th th those were the followers of Jesus, those ladies who were at the cross, including his mother and others. There were many followers there watching Jesus' death on the cross. So when Jesus died on the cross Friday, there were there those who grieved over his death. Number two, there were those there that were glad that he died. Now follow me, guys. Don't miss this. We know what Jesus did the last week of his life, and here he's dying on the cross. Some grieved, and some were happy about it. Some were glad that he died. Who was that? The religious leaders. They're the ones that knelt him to the cross. Their jealousy, their envy of Jesus. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priest, they were glad they got him out of the way. People were following him instead of following them. When Jesus died on Friday, there were those who were grieved over his death. Some who were glad that he died. Then old Satan gloated over his death. Write it down, friends. Satan gloated over Jesus' death. He thought he finally won. Say amen to that. He's dead. The demons in hell had a party on Friday. They gloated 
over his death. But I want to say three things. To those who grieved over Jesus' death, I want to say it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. To those who were glad that Jesus died, I want to say it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And I want to say to that rotten loser, Satan, that was so exact, so excited, gloated over his death, I want you to know, loser, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. <laughs> Woo, thank you, Jesus. What happened Saturday? Pull it down. There's, Saturday was the Pharisees. Here they are again. They go, to, they go to Pilate and say, you know what? I guarantee his disciples are going to try to come and steal his body. Read it in the Gospels. The Pharisees have a meeting with Pilate. Pilate gives them authority to seal the stone and set a guard. Like that's going to keep Jesus out of the grave, moron. Saturday, Pharisees met with Pilate. Make sure they could seal the stone and set a guard at his, at his grave. But then comes Sunday. Thank you, Jesus. Power over death. <laughs> Woo! Well, it started off pretty good Sunday, and it even ended better the next Sunday. Don't get any better than a parade, but it ain't any better than Jesus coming forth from the grave. And the Bible says in Romans 1, 4, and when he came forth from the grave, he declared to be the Son of God with power. That's why I say power over death. With power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now I want you to fill in the blanks, please. In the four Gospels, there are 36 miracles. Make sure you put miracles. I don't think it's in your outline. There are 36 miracles in the Gospels that Jesus performed. Of course, he performed more than that. There's just 36 mentioned. Are y'all out there, please? Remember what John said when he wrote his Gospel? He said, if, I wrote, if we wrote everything that he did, the world couldn't contain it. So the Holy Spirit was very selective in what miracles that are found in the Gospels. And by the way, those 36 miracles, every one of them are a miracle with a message. We could spend 36 weeks on those miracles because every one of them, why did he select 36? There were more than 36. John said if we wrote everything down he did, you, you couldn't write it all. But the Holy Spirit was very selective in the 36 miracles that he performed. Years ago at Robinwood, I did a study. It didn't take 36 weeks. It took about 10 weeks because I do two or three at a time. But did the 36 miracles and why those miracles are found in God's Word. And by the way, guys, it speaks about your life and mine. Because Jesus come to minister to us. And though every miracle Jesus performed was a miracle with a message. Uh, so there's 36 miracles. Keep writing. There are 38 parables in the Gospels. Jesus told 38 parables are found in the Gospels. Over half of them, by the way, deal with money. Oh, oh. I'm sorry I got shot you, sir. I just but. Uh. Over half of his parables dealt with stewardship. You show me your billfold, and I'll show you where your heart is. Stewardship speaks louder than anything else we do about our love for Jesus. You can say amen to that, and I don't care if you do or not. Over half of the parables had to deal with, with stewardship. Keep writing. There's 19 prayers mentioned in the four Gospels. Jesus prayed all the time, but there's 19 of them specifically mentioned in the four Gospels. There's seven last statements, and you all are aware of that on the cross. Jesus made seven last statements on the cross. Now, it's interesting. Jesus went to the cross. Look up here. The Jews had at least five opportunities. Those three and a half years Jesus' ministry. Those three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry. Because he did not start ministering until he was 30. They watched him for three and a half years. And the Jews had five opportunities to know who Jesus was, that he was the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. They knew that because of five things they saw with Jesus and what they had available. Look up here, guys. Five. Five is the number of, say it out loud, please. Grace. One of the things that broke Jesus' heart 
that last week is the Passover. Three million Jews are coming, and I love Ray Boats, Watch the Lamb. Anybody remember that song? I love that song, Watch the Lamb. Three million Jews that week of the Passover. And one of the things that broke Jesus' heart, Brother Ennis, was this. That last week on this earth, as he watched all three million Jews come to the Passover, he saw their religion, he saw their rituals, but they had no relationship to him. He saw their religion. He saw their rituals because they brought their lambs to sacrifice. That was an Old Testament ritual. So for the last week of Jesus' life, he saw three million of his own countrymen sacrificing lambs. Every one of them was a picture of Jesus, the sacrificial lamb. The Bible calls Jesus our Passover lamb. And that week, Jesus saw him sacrificing lamb after lamb after lamb. He saw their religion. He saw their rituals. But it broke his heart that they had no relationship to him. They had five opportunities to trust Jesus as their Messiah and their Savior and Lord. But they wouldn't do it. I want you to notice those five opportunities they had. Number one, they had the scriptures. Say amen to that, please. You see, the Jews had the 39 Old Testament books. Say amen to that. They had 39 Old Testament books. They had at least the Torah, the first five books of Moses. They had 39 books in the Old Testament that all pointed to Jesus the Messiah. The Old Testament is all about prophesying the one who's to come to be the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world. All thir- they had 39 books. Write down in your outline, please. There were 382. How many? There were 382 prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled at Christ's first coming. 382 of them. They studied the scriptures frontwards and backwards, friends. They knew what the prophecy said about the coming Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled all 382. All 382 prophecies said that he's the Messiah. This is the one you've been looking for, Israel. This is the Savior of the world. But they rejected him. Five opportunities to receive him. 382 prophecies fulfilled right there before them by his birth. Him even going to Egypt as a little boy was prophesied. Then his life, those three and a half years, hundreds of prophecies fulfilled and they watched it. They watched Jesus everywhere he went because they were jealous of him. They were always trying to trap him. Y'all know that. He's always trying to trap Jesus. They watched him day and night. And they saw 382 prophecies fulfilled, but yet they rejected him. Number two, not only did they have the scriptures to tell who Jesus was, but they had his supernatural ministry and miracles. Please say amen to that. For three and a half years, they watched Jesus' ministry. Three and a half years, they watched Jesus do miracle after miracle after miracle. Look up here, guys. And every time they saw Jesus perform a miracle, you know, it's interesting that Jesus said of his cousin, John the Baptist, there's never been man, a man born a woman greater than John the Baptist. One of the ironic things about John the Baptist, he never performed one miracle. He never performed one miracle. We put a lot of stock in people and we, and our heroes who performed miracles, that's all right. Jesus. But John the Baptist never performed one miracle. And as they watched Jesus day after day after day perform miracle, look up here. 
They knew only God could take five loaves and two small fishes and feed 5,000. Who's ever seen that before? What prophet did that in the Old Testament? They watched him as he turned, blinded his eyes so they could see. Only God can cleanse and make a leper whole and they saw him cleansing lepers. <laughs> Only God can calm a storm. Are y'all out there? Sometimes he calms the storm. Sometimes he calms the saints. But only God can calm the storm. Only God can calm the saint as we go through the storms of life. No doctor can do that. He'll give you pills, medicine, well and good. But only God can calm the saint in the midst of the storms. And they see him and watched him do that over and over only God had power over disease, demons, and death. They washed it with their eyes. It was like Jesus on steroids of all that he was doing those three and a half years. Miracle after miracle to say, this is... This is one you're looking for, guys. This is one that your parents told you about, read to you about those stories when you was going to the synagogue and studying the Torah. It's the one that Moses told you was coming. I, I, I'm, I'm him. Look up here. This next one really blow you away, but look up here. It's one of the greatest testimonies of who Jesus was. They had five opportunities. Look up here. They had, they had the scriptures. They had his supernatural ministry and miracles. But number three, they had the sanctuary. They had the temple. Guys, did you know that everything in the temple, the temple itself, was a picture and a type of Jesus? Can I have some help, please? Every piece of furniture in that temple, everything about that temple, when God gave Moses the instructions to build the temple called the tabernacle in the Old Testament, everything about it, the veil, the colors, all the things, every one of them were a picture of Jesus. So every time those Jews would go to the temple, it's a picture of Jesus. The golden censer says Jesus is the light of the world. The showbread says he's the bread of life. The incense, the priest, it's a picture that Jesus is our great high priest. Did you know even the colors of the sanctuary speak of Jesus? The three main colors, look up here, please. We'll look at everybody look up here first. There are three main colors that are found in the Old Testament. There are three that God gave to Moses for a reason. He didn't have hair like Darlene. That wasn't part of the deal. And it's beautiful. But look up here. The colors that God the Father chose for the temple was a picture of his son. The three main colors were blue. That's, that's the third one, purple and red. And all three colors, every time they would look at those colors, remind them that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. Write it down in your outline. Blue is the color of heaven. And it says that Jesus is the spiritual one who came from heaven. Say amen to that, guys. See, his home was in heaven and he came down from heaven as the spiritual one. Blue speaks of heaven. Blue speaks of where Jesus came from. Write it down. Purple, the color of royalty, speaks of Jesus as the sovereign one. The sovereign one. King of kings. Lord of lords. Royal robes. Then, of course, red speaks of the color 
of the blood of Jesus as the sacrificial one. As the sacrificial one. As Jesus came to pour out his rich, red, royal blood for your sins and mine and the sins of the world. Guys, can you imagine All, all, it's like screaming out to the world, I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior. It's like it's screaming out. Yet they rejected him. We're going to get up today in just a few moments, so don't get so hard on the Jews because we're worse than they are. So we'll get to the, our part. We'll get to our part big boy in just a minute we're worse than they are they had the scriptures number two supernatural ministry and miracles of Jesus number three they had the sanctuary number four they had a servant a servant by the name of John the Baptist. You say, what's, all, well, what's, so, what's so big about that? Well, look up here, friends. If you know your Bible, you know that it's been 400 years there hadn't been a prophet in Israel. From Malachi to Matthew, that's called the 400 silent years. Hadn't been a voice from heaven. Hadn't had a prophet from God for 400 years in Israel. But they were all looking for that forerunner when the Messiah would come. The prophets prophesied there'd be one. When the Messiah would come, there'd be one like Elijah who'd prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And when the John the Baptist got here, go up here, friends. John the Baptist was the greatest prophet and the number one evangelist in Israel. Crowds by the thousands flocked to hear him in the desert. The most powerful voice in Israel has been silent for 400 years. And it's like 100 Billy Graham show up at one time. He was the Billy Graham of his day. Everybody knew John the Baptist. They knew what the prophecy said. He'd be the forerunner of the Messiah. So he watched him day and night. Wonder when he's going to announce the Messiah. Wonder when it's going to be. All eyes on John the Baptist, the prophet like Elijah. Then one day, Jesus came to the Jordan River to be baptized. And the greatest prophet of that day and the greatest evangelist stood and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Their number one prophet, their number one evangelist pointed out to the Jews, that's him. <laughs> All eyes were on him. Man, he's the greatest. Since Elijah, it's him because he's wearing the same clothes that Elijah wore. This is him, that prophet. Then when everybody gathered that day to watch him baptize his cousin, he left no doubt about it. Sometimes you and I witness and people are still scratching their heads. There was no scratching your heads that day when John the Baptist stood in the power of the Holy Spirit of God and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yet they turned and walked away. They had the scriptures. They had the supernatural ministry and miracles of Jesus. They had the sanctuary they looked at every day. They had a servant named John the Baptist. But most importantly, they had a Savior named Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you've, seen my fa if you've seen me, you've seen my Father, for I and the Father are one. You heard what the prophets said. Those prophets were speaking of me.
he came and laid down his life. For people who were glad that he died, an old Lucifer who was gloated over his death, had all these opportunities. But you know what John 1.11 says? It says this. He came into his own, and his own received him not. You see, if you and I would have been there as Gentiles, we wouldn't have understood all that stuff. Are you out there, please? Do you understand that? Don't mean nothing to us Gentiles. We know what the scriptures were. We didn't read them. We know what the sanctuary means to Gentiles. He came first to the house of Israel. Are you all out there, please? We know what the sanctuary stands for. It's just a beautiful, magnificent place. We're just Gentiles. You don't understand about people offering up lambs. They heard the stories. People would come around because they heard stories of this miracle person that could perform miracles. Who's John the Baptist? That don't mean nothing to, the, to Gentiles. He's not one of us. This is not Aristotle, Plato, or Socrates. It's just a prophet in the wilderness. <laughs> he was so bad he got beheaded. Who's this Savior? You see, Jesus came first to the house of Israel, but he came to be all man's Savior. But he came to be the Messiah to Israel, the Savior of the world. Israel's Messiah, our Savior. Now, this is really a good Sunday morning service, and that's why I was planning to preach it this morning because it's got a strong invitation to come to Jesus. But the Lord led us a different direction, and that's his business, not mine. But living today, we have five opportunities. A person who's never received Christ as their Lord and Savior, and a person whose name's never been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there's five ways you can know that Jesus was, who he says he was, the Savior of the world. Would you write them down? Number one, we got the Scriptures. And guess what? We got more than 39. We got 66. Woo! They had 39. We got 66. And anywhere you turn from Genesis to Revelation... It says, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. So don't be so hard on our Jewish friends. They had 39, we got 66. Number two, not only do we have the scriptures, but number two, would you write it down? We got the saints' testimony. Look around you. Don't take you long to do that. There are men and women here tonight who can testify that Jesus touched and changed your life. Amen. I love Ray Boats. I pray for Ray Boats every day, by the way. And you should too. And don't act like you do if you don't. But I pray for four men specifically who are like Demas in my life. I pastored 40 years and four men that used to be strong servants for Jesus don't serve him anymore. It breaks my heart. Because these four men are a tremendous blessing to my life and have been. 
And every morning in my prayer time, I pray for these four men that God would do whatever he has to do to restore them. Because they're like Demas. They've forsaken Jesus for this present world. And that's what the Bible says about Demas. And I don't take that lightly because that could happen to me as well. Some of you know friends that you had that used to be servants of Jesus. They're not serving him anymore. And you failed to pray for them. I love these four men. The first one on my list is my brother-in-law, Prentice Lofton, my wife's brother, and she knows this. I love Prentice Lofton, my brother-in-law. Used to be a strong servant for Jesus. One of the most talented and gifted artists and singers. He lived with Kathy and I. Like her little brother, I helped raise all them kids. But he came out to California to be our minister of music interim. I love Prentice Lofton. He lived with us and could sing the stars down for Jesus. Play any kind of instrument. <laughs> any kind of instrument, couldn't he, baby? Play any kind. I love to pray, and Brian, I wish you could hear him play the 12 string guitar. He was an opera singer who traveled all over Europe, sang in opera houses, some of the largest in Europe. But Prentice is uh, not serving the Lord anymore. And uh, we love him dearly. But I pray for the British. There's two other men you don't know. So I won't mention their names. They're both from Robin Wood Baptist Church. But they both ministered to my life. And God used them in a mighty way. And the last one's Ray Boats. It broke my heart when he left his wife for a man. He wrote some of the most anointed songs ever. Are y'all out there? God, I love to hear those songs. My anchor holds. Don't get any better than that. Watch the Lamb. All those songs. I pray for them every day. And I wish someone, if I did that, you'd pray for me. But every one of you here tonight knows someone that used to be on fire for the Lord. Don't just talk about them. Pray for them. We need them back. But what we have today that is a great testimonies of people like you. That I once was blind, but now I see, was lost, but now I'm found. And hear your testimonies. They don't have to listen to the preacher, but they'll listen to a lay person who Jesus has changed your life. Today we have the scriptures. Today we have the saints' testimony. But thirdly, tonight you have this sermon I'm preaching. You know what this sermon's all about? Come to Jesus. Please. Come to Jesus. Fourthly, if that's not enough, we have the Spirit of God. And Revelation 22 says, 
the Spirit says, come to Jesus. I'm grateful this morning the Spirit of God said to Talon's wife, to Greg and Leanne's daughter, come to Jesus. <laughs> Can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. And then if that's not enough, thank God we got the Savior <laughs> who stands at our heart's door in Revelation 3.20 and says, Behold, I stand at your door and knock. If any man will open up the door of your heart and invite me in, I'll come and live with you and you with me. Five opportunities to come to Jesus. Go ahead, Kathy. You're here tonight or you're watching online and God's Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and said, come to Jesus tonight. You opened up God's word with us and God's word says come to Jesus tonight. We got people all over this auditorium who could stand and testify of what Jesus has done for them. The Savior says come tonight, please. If you're not sure your name's been written in that Lamb's Book of Life, you can be sure tonight. I'm gonna ask every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed. Bible says in Romans 10, 13, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved tonight. If he's knocking on your heart's door, if he's calling you, the Holy Spirit's calling you to come to Jesus, please do that. Would you pray this prayer in your heart right now as I pray it out loud? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know without you, I'm lost. But tonight, dear Jesus, I hear the call. I hear the knock. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to forgive me of all my sins. And I ask you to come into my heart tonight and be my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're home, you prayed that prayer. We have a young lady. We'd love to hear from you. There's a phone number there on the bottom of your screen that you can dial. You prayed that prayer. Let us know. We just want to say thank God for you. Welcome to the family. If you're here tonight at Cornerstone. You prayed that prayer as a testimony to Jesus. If you did, would you raise your hand? Anybody here? Church, I want us to uh, look up here. Let's, uh, let's pray. and Got a lot to be thankful for, don't we? We don't have to guess what Jesus was doing the last week of his life. Because it's all about you and it's all about me. Ladies, y'all go over there and pray for Diane. She's leaving uh, Thursday. David has his doctor's appointment Tuesday. So ladies, would y'all pray with Diane? We're gonna take, take advantage of doing that. You men, would y'all come down here with me? The rest of you men.
to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. To be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for A sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for To be a sanctuary.